the lights are dimming and I have been reliably informed that is when we start. So good evening and welcome. What a pleasure it is to welcome you all here and not least to have people in person again. Isn't it just wonderful? Um, so thank you for joining us um, tonight um, for what I, I think is going to be a really special and a very important and probably a little bit more timely discussion than I think any of us may have thought about when, when this was being planned um, several months ago. Um, my name is Rachel Briggs. I am an Associate Fellow here at Chatham House with the International Security Programme and also run an organisation called the Clarity Factory. Um, shall I dispense with the housekeeping before we get, before we get started so we all know the rules uh, before, before we get going? Um, so I'm asked to remind you that the event today is on the record. It is actually being recorded. Um, we, uh, if you wish to use uh, Twitter, uh, please feel free to do so, or, or your chosen social media platform. Um, and if you do, we would love it if you would use the hashtag CH events, at CH as in Chatham House, CH events, um, so that we can kind of gather the conversation online nicely. Um, for those of you who are joining from home, and I'm not quite, or, or uh, virtually, and I'm not quite sure where to sort of locate you, but um, uh, please do um, feel free to, uh, send us your questions in as, as we go along. That's the, the benefit you get of being virtual as a poster in the room. We will be collecting them up as we go. You can ask them at any time, but please use the Q&A function as opposed to the raise hand or chat function as those will be um, disabled. So now the housekeeping's out of the way, let's, let's get on with the, the substance of the discussion tonight. Um, I, I think given events over the last couple of weeks, which <coughs> just keep rumbling and keep getting almost worse by the day, the hour, even, even the minute um, coming out of Ukraine. I think we've had a, another reminder of just how precious democracy is, how precious um, and important um, our human rights are. Um, and I, 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 I want to open our event tonight with, with that in mind. Um, and that, that important reminder of, of how precious those, those rights um, and privileges are. Um, earlier this year, we, we marked the 20th anniversary, believe it or not, of the opening of Guantanamo Bay prison in Cuba. Um, for a number of years, of course, we didn't even know of its existence if we weren't being held there or working there. Um, and I remember um, sort of slowly but surely having the details of this place being revealed, um, how people had got there being revealed, what was happening to them as they were being held there, um, in many cases with no charge, with no evidence being, being brought against them uh, for, for so, so long. Um, and, and many, a, a number of remain there to this day. And as I was reflecting on the legacy of Guantanamo Bay prison, I, I guess I, I just came away with the, the feeling that it really doesn't matter which side of this argument you're on. It really doesn't matter what bit of the jigsaw of Guantanamo you fall into. The legacy is painful. It doesn't matter which way you look at it. It's, it's painful and it's uncomfortable. Um, and things were done in the heat of the moment um, which uh, do not stand the test of human rights and dignity and ethics and the rule of, of law. Um, and for those who would say that these were extraordinary times, well, you bet yeah, if, if you were inside that, that institution, they were extraordinary times. Um, and so tonight, 20 years on, as I say, with this, with this ongoing reminder of the fragility and the importance of democracy and its principles and, 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 and so on, we're here tonight to, to reflect really on the legacy of Guantanamo Bay, what it reflects not just in terms of the institution itself, but what it reflects more widely um, on our politics and our, our democracies and our, our societies. And I, I don't know about any of you, but over the last 20 years, as I've been involved in conversations in beautiful <laughs> buildings like this about the war on terror and how we respond and so on, so many of those conversations have felt um, fairly abstract as if those of us fortunate enough to be around those big tables have been somehow playing a game of three-dimensional chess with uh, big pieces that, that are sort of really have a place somewhere else um, in, a different, in a different room and in a different place. Well, no such 
no such theoretical discussion tonight, uh, no abstract discussions tonight. Um, and um, really, I am thrilled, honoured, um, and so pleased to be able to welcome here tonight um, a very distinguished panel of speakers who will help guide us through this really, really difficult terrain. Um, first and not least, um, and very importantly, uh, Mohamedou, who um, knows that institution, I, I suspect, but much better than any of us do, and can give us um, a reality check on any of those esoteric abstract discussions. He was held there between 2002 and 2016. Um, having arrived there variously via Jordan and Afghanistan. Um, he <clears throat> has the, <clears throat> the distinction um, of uh, being described as uh, perhaps the worst tortured of the 800 or so folks who were, who were held there. And he has written a book which I think is extraordinary um, piece of history and testimony, which is called Guantanamo Diary, which is his recording of, of what happened to him. And I have to say it was one of the most difficult things I've read, but I think perhaps the most important thing I've ever, I've ever read as well. Um, no charges, no trial, um, all of those years. Uh, but thankfully he is here with us today and um, doing very, very important things uh, with his life today, which we will all um, benefit from enormously. Um, Mohamedou, I, as we said when we were talking a few minutes earlier, I couldn't possibly ask you to tell us your story because we'd need a two-week conference for that, not a one-hour meeting. Perhaps you could give us your reflections. What does Guantanamo and its legacy mean to you? <clears throat> Rachel, thank you so much. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Mohamedou Orflahi and I am a former Guantanamo detainee. I spent between Guantanamo and other secret prison a little bit over 15 years, and I spent, spent in house arrest about five years. So 20 years of my life was between uh, secret prison Guantanamo Bay and being uh, uh, limited in a, a space that I couldn't leave. And as Rachel said, this was all outside the rule of law. And uh, I'm going to use her words, no abstract discussion. And I want to stick out. Today, what I will tell you, you will not forget. Because I will tell you a story. And people don't forget stories. Two months before Guantanamo Bay was in operation, precisely on November 20th of 2001, around 4 p.m., I came back from work. Uh, I used to be a program, you know, I program a webmaster for a, a local provider. I came back to was Ramadan. Ramadan is uh, the Muslim holy month where we, you know, uh, limit our diet so we could remember those who don't have food or who have much less food than us. And I was really tired, you know. And uh, so those two cups showed up at our home. They were in plain clothes. Mukhabarat. Mukhabarat mean intelligence service. But in a democracy, the intelligence service are people we don't meet every day. In Arab countries, we meet them every single day. So we know them better than we know the people in uniform. So they came to me and they say, it was only me and my mother in the house. Just as it were, because usually the house is full, but it was only me and my mother, as if she wanted to tell me goodbye for the last time. And uh, they came to me, they said, you need to come with us. You know, I was scared, but I could see the real fear 
in my mother's eyes. This is not the UK. This is not the United States of America. This is not a Western democracy where the police come to you and said, we arrest you in the name of the law because of one, two, three. Those are orders coming from the most powerful country in the world, i.e. United States of America talking to a military dictator, giving him orders to arrest one of his citizens. And this is like, you cannot get stronger than this. And I vividly remember a few days after 9-11, uh, uh, the former president George W. Bush said something uh, to the effect that Al-Qaeda attacked the United States because of their lifestyle, but they would never defeat the United States. Ironically, the first thing that the United States of America did was completely turn its back to the rule of law and democracy, and completely when it comes to people coming from Africa, me and the Middle East, they don't deserve the rule of law. The ex executive power plays the, the judiciary power and the executioner at the same time. I was taken, and this is like, you guys, let's, let's be honest here. You guys see those crazy, demented people in Africa, in the Middle East, who blow themselves up. But this is only one tiny, teeny, tiny piece of the puzzle. You guys don't see the suffering of people who are being picked up from their home, never to come back, tortured and put back. Those people can only, this kind of uh, dictatorship, this kind of authoritarian regime, can only produce crazy people. And uh, I was taken to Jordan, long story short, and from Jordan, I was taken to Bagram. All of this free of charge. I never paid any ticket, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> you know, I always, and a plane was chartered, especially for me. So I wasn't doing bad on, on, you know, riding. And I remember this, you know, when they took me from Jordan, I was completely destroyed. Eight months in darkness. I didn't know most of the time, day or night. And I tried to keep the days, counting them in my head. When I arrived in Bagram, I saw that I lost many days. And I thought they were taking me back to Mauritania after eight months, but when they start like ripping my clothes with a scissor, the guy, so I was completely naked, the guy removed my, uh, the, the blindfold, you know, to give me a gesture to open my mouth, and I saw his arm, it was blunt. So I knew I was taken by the American, I just, you know, those documentary I watched in Germany about the brutal uh, penitentiary system in the United States of America. I'm not talking about Muslim, black, I'm talking about just regular average American and how brutal the system is. I know someone like me with bad accent. I didn't speak English now, I'm speaking English. So, And then I'm Muslim, Arab, African. This is all bad news. And I start regretting everything I did bad in my life. I regretted every bad comment I made to my mother, to my sisters, to my brothers, to the person I was in love with. And I promise to God, if I ever get a chance to be alive again, I promise to be a kind person. And from that moment, I took a vow of kindness to be a kind person no matter what, because that's what would matter to me in my life. You know, and uh, I, I, the rest of the story is in my book. I don't want to ruin it because I wanted to buy my book, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I I'm a businessman. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> and, and that's, I mean, in a sense, that's your legacy. And it's interesting what you say about the kindness, because as I was reading your book, 
I kind of thought, how does this guy remain so balanced and apparently give people the benefit of the doubt? And in spite of terrible, terrible things that folks were doing, you could see a chink of humor there, or you could see a chink of um, goodness in that in that person. And I, wow, so that's that's extraordinary to know that that was the vow that that you made. And and what are your reflections on what it means, what Guantanamo means to the to the world? I mean, ha, have you got to that place of reflecting on that yet? You know, what you know, besides being an institution that did X, Y, Z, what does this thing mean to us all? What is the meaning that we should take from it? So why do we I know this Chatham House, smart people. Why do we bitch about Guantanamo Bay all the time? Guantanamo Bay is not only in Cuba. Guantanamo Bay is in Africa, is in the Middle East, in Iraq, in Syria, in authoritarian regime, in China, in Russia. And now we see those horrific stuff that is happening to our brothers and sisters in, uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. We talk about Guantanamo Bay and we think it matters because it was founded, financed, controlled by not only a democracy, but the leader of the free world. And unfortunately, the free world conspired, conspired with the United States of America at almost every level to completely turn it back to the values of democracy. And I am from Africa. You know, and we are still struggling to enjoy the same freedom that you enjoy here. You take those freedom for granted, you know. And when we see that, like the United States is as if they are saying democracy doesn't work, this is like the end of it. We are going back. We are going back to torture, and we did go back to torture. We are going back not to allow citizen, you know, to have their voices and. The, Guantanamo Bay was a God given to dictatorships. You know, uh, the other day I was, uh, I was uh, reading, uh, you know, the condemnation of the United States, of China, of uh, building prison for the Uyghurs. China said, those are extremists, Muslim extremists. We do to them what you do to Muslim extremists in Guantanamo Bay. If I was an American official, I would have no answer to this. Absolutely no answer. Because who decides with the extremists? You know, this is completely to whatever the fantasy of uh, whoever is in power, unfortunately. That's why Guantanamo Bay does not belong to democracy. Your country, your country helped the United States in rendering people to Guantanamo Bay, you know, in flying them over to Guantanamo Bay. And this is, you are better than this, you know. Thank you. Um, I'll now turn to Sonia, who's the um, CEO of a rather wonderful organization called Freedom From Torture, which if you are not familiar with it, if you haven't heard it, get on its website immediately that you leave this event and find out about the work that it does, because it's really important. Um, Sonia, just a sort of an easy question for you really is, how could we, why, why is it still open? <laughs> why, why, why does the uh, institution persist and how, how might we get to a point where it's ready to close the gates? Thank you, I will, I will come to that. And um, it is really lovely to be here um, tonight, thank you. And it's a real privilege to be on a panel alongside you, Mahamadou. And I wanted to start by commending you and thanking you for your resilience, your bravery and your determination to use um, not only your skills, but also your experience to keep shining the light on the terrors that have happened in Guantanamo Bay and to f your f determination to fight for the rights of those who are still there and the other former detainees who are um, still living in, in very difficult circumstances. So thank you. Um, I wanted to sort of just pick up before I come to this question, why on earth is this institution still open? Um, this This kind of point that Mahamadou um, has already started to explain to us about the terrible stain that Guantanamo has left on the reputation of the United States and on the reputation of the allies 
um, that colluded um, in, in that terrible institution's operation. I was a, an associate fellow here in the international law program at Chatham House for 15 plus years. And I remember being on a um, research trip to Geneva where I met an American diplomat who in, in, in confidence said to me that he would personally never ever forgive the CIA for the damage that it had caused through, through the torture and Guantanamo and the renditions to the credibility of the United States as an advocate for human rights globally. This is an American official. And, you know, to, to add to that, I also just wanted to kind of bring into the room the significance that Guantanamo has for survivors of torture across the world and not only those who have survived um, the experiences that Mohamedou uh, alluded to. It, it has a totemic significance. It is the absolute um, point in time at which democracies, the most powerful democracy of all, signalled that it was turning its back on the global absolute prohibition of torture. And it catalyzed a free fall um, in public and political support for the norm um, against torture, which we had for many hundreds of, hundreds of years been building up um, globally. So I just think it is so important that we kind of enter into these discussions um, with an appreciation of what it has cost us. So why is it still open to come to your question, Rachel? So the first thing I wanted to say is that Guantanamo Bay was created by Americans and it must be dissolved by Americans too. It can happen. The barriers to it um, are not legal and they are not practical. The problem is a problem of political will. Under President Bush, there was indeed a political consensus that Guantanamo Bay needed to be shut. And under his administration, 500 or so um, of the detainees, the vast majority, um, were actually um, transferred out. Obama um, and indeed McCain both campaigned um, on a platform, a pledge to, to close um, Guantanamo, but Obama very quickly backpedaled from that um, when he came into power. He opted not to prosecute um, those who had been responsible for the CIA torture and that led the way for some quite remarkable and shocking comebacks um, then when um, President Trump came into power and Gina Haspel, who was deeply implicated, um, uh, became the head of the CIA. This is what happens if you do not pursue accountability. It comes back. Trump then came to power. Um, he uh, formally reversed um, Obama's um, still extant commitment to close Guantanamo, but he generally maintained the status quo for another four wasted years. And now we come to the administration of President Biden. He also has pledged to close Guantanamo, but there has been very little concrete action to date. Two, de two detainees um, have been released so far um, under his administration, including the repatriation to, South, uh, sorry, to Saudi Arabia this week of Mohammed al Qatani. Um, who was tortured so badly by American interrogators, and indeed this is admitted, um, that he was ineligible to even stand trial. So this is where we are. We have 38 people still um, detained in the um, facility. Half or so of those have been cleared for release, um, but the, the facility still remains open um, 20 years on. So it's a political challenge at this, at this point in time, Sonia. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm going to now turn to our third speaker who um, is joining us online. Um, I'm not quite sure how this works, so will you help me along if I make a dreadful mistake here? But I think that Fran uh, should be joining us from the US. Can you hear us, Fran? Can we see you? We can't. <laughs> no? No, that's. Thank you. Um, 
Um, so I don't think we can hear from him just yet, but we'll give you enough to oh, it seems now. Fran, can you hear us? We can't hear you. Oh no. We're just really all trying to learn to do this stuff again, aren't we? It's extraordinary. <laughs> what's the what's the story of how many people does it take to change a light bulb? I feel there's there's a relevance to that here. Shall we just keep going with the conversation? Why not? I'm sure this we have plenty to, to talk about. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm terrible at multitasking, so somebody might have to help me realize this, um, realize this ambition. Um, so um, can I, uh, maybe before we um, turn to the audience for some questions, and some have started coming in online, um, I also just wanted to ask about um, the, the personal legacy of um, experiencing something akin to, or actually Guantanamo, um, Sonia, I know your organization works extensively with the victims of torture. Um, could you just give us a, I mean, I think I can imagine that it must be psychologically difficult to recover from, but just, just talk us through some of the practicalities of what your organization sees in the course of its work and how difficult it can be for folks who are, who are coming out of a situation like that to actually recover, move on, get jobs, have families, you know, all the stuff that many of us take for granted. So Freedom From Torture is one of the largest torture rehabilitation centres in, in the world. Um, we've been operating for more than 35 years and we were actually founded uh, by a tenacious young British woman who travelled to Bergen-Belsen to help survivors um, of the Holocaust. And she returned to Britain and um, became very active um, in Amnesty International. And together um, with the doctors group of Amnesty International, decided to form our organisation. We spun out from the doctors group of Amnesty um, back in 1985. And we have been providing um, clinical services to survivors of torture from all over the world um, ever since. Um, we, we focus on um, providing therapies, um, but our model is a holistic one. And, and in the way that you um, alluded to, Rachel, um, the problems that survivors of torture in this country face are just legion. Um, the vast majority of them, almost all of those we treat, um, are asylum seekers and refugees. And so on top um, of the post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, uh, depress depression symptoms that so many of them are battling. They are deeply impoverished, have insecure legal status um, for very long periods of time and are suffering all of the complications of, of life in exile. But the one thing which I would really particularly like to draw attention to is um, the difficulty of, of being believed. And I think this is something that um, links us very neatly to um, the plight of those who have survived the terrible horrors of, of Guantanamo and the reason why justice mm. is so very important. When you, when you work as we do um, day in, day out with survivors of torture, they will talk a lot about the terrible pain of not being believed and um, of tendencies to minimise what they have been through. Um, torturing states officially deny that life-changing and personally destructive experience. And then for those who come here to claim asylum, they have the double jeopardy then of being disbelieved mm -hmm via our migration system, the asylum system in particular. And this is just so desperately psychologically shattering um, for people. And it's a reason why the pursuit of justice and accountability is so important, because it is, it is the official validation of those experiences and the passport through to reparations. And it is so rare 
I can count on one hand the number of survivors of torture who I've worked um, with since 2008 who have had any measure of justice. And it is the same for the survivors of Guantanamo. Um, just think, you know, situating ourselves here in the United Kingdom about um, those who were the victims and survivors of the British complicity in the renditions, etc., cetera, um, that Mohamedou um, uh, alluded to earlier. They still have not had proper justice, even um, the commitments to run a proper inquiry, a judge-led inquiry into the evidence of British um, collusion in, in torture, you know, were left at the end of the day empty handed and it just compounds the trauma in ways that it is very difficult to even um, impart. And so this is one of the reasons why it's so very important um, that, you know, we mark the 20th anniversary of the opening of Guantanamo in the way that we have, but also ensure that we're not losing the flame and diminishing our calls for justice for the survivors. It's terribly important. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to try again. Um, Francis, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can. Can everybody in the room hear him? Yeah. Oh, goodness me. Um, well, welcome. Welcome very much to the discussion. Can everybody, how does this thing, people, we can see it. Brilliant. Okay, this is amazing. Um, so I'm very pleased that we are finally uh, able to be joined by um, Francis Gilligan, who is Director of Training for the Military Commission's um, Prosecutors, um, previously a trial, a Chief Trial Judge for the US Army, and he has indeed argued cases against um, detainees on behalf of the US government, but is, is currently and, and in most recent years involved in training. Um, I'm really pleased that Francis can, can be here to join this conversation. Um, he is here speaking in a personal capacity. He's not representing the big old US um, government. And, and you'll understand that he can't talk about specific cases and he can't sort of allude to, um, to um, intelligence. So Francis, I, in, in sort of several minutes, I wonder if you could um, maybe pick up on some of the, the conversation we've had around the challenge of uh, to close Guantanamo. And, and of course, from your perspective, that involves um, trying the, the individuals who, are, who remain there. Perhaps if you could pick it up there, that would be great. I will. Thank, thank you for inviting me and I'll be, I'll be very brief and factual. There's a lot of misconception about the rights that the detainees have at Guantanamo. So first, I want to dispel that. I want to talk about the rights they have there. They have a right to a presumption of innocence, a right to counsel free of charge. Those charged with death penalty cases are, have a right to have experienced death penalty counsels. There has to be proof beyond a reasonable doubt. They have a right to silence. Statements obtained by torture may not be admitted at those trials there. They have to be truly voluntary statements. They have a right to call and cross-examine witnesses. They have a right to all the evidence used by the prosecution, including classified information if it cannot be summarized. They have a right to a public trial in an open trial in which the public is invited, the press is invited to. They have a right to notice of charges in their own language. They have a right to a trial by jury. They have a right to question the jury to see if they're biased in any way. If they are, they have a right to challenge them for cause. They have a right to peremptory challenges, challenges with no cause at all. They have a right to plead guilty even though they think they are innocent. On that, if they if there's a they believe the government has a factual basis to prove them guilty, they have a right to appellate review by judges appointed by the president and confirmed by the by the Senate. And if they're dissatisfied with that case, they have a right to go to the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia and a right to go to the Supreme Court by a writ of certiorari and five of the cases have been heard there. They also have rights that I do not have as a civilian. They have a right to double jeopardy that is much more stringent than I would face in a federal district court here. They have a right to a verbatim record of trial that's free. 
They have a right to have mitigation specialists paid for by the government. That does not exist in the courts in the United, in the United States. They have a right to have jury consultants to be with them at government expense. I've been asked many times, why does it take so long to try these cases? What's wrong? Can't you try these cases? We have in these cases, in the 9-11 case, this is the killing of nearly 3,000 Americans. In that case there, we have 6,000 filings in that case. In the U.S. coal bombing case, the case that took place in Aden Harbor, we have 2,700 filings that resulted in the murder of 17 sailors in that particular case there. Of course, because of the complexity of these cases, we have to review in, in answer to those filings, we have to review more than 6 million documents and then turn over the documents that would be helpful to the defense. We have reviewed those documents and we have turned over to the defense 300,000 written documents for your, their use that are relevant and helpful for their trials here at Guantanamo. Of course, some of the information is classified. All the governments in the, in the, in the world have a right to a state secret privilege, and we do too. We try to protect national security. And we also have probably the most open and transparent trial system in the United States. All those filings I mentioned to you, nearly 10,000, if you go to the DOD military commissions on the website, all those filings are there for you to see. The transcripts of the eight trials we had already are there for you to see. And the many months of pretrial hearings, those transcripts are on that site too. So we have one of the most transparent courts you can see. We have a rules now against torture. Not only that, our rule now for if we're questioning detainees, it must be videotaped or done through electronic recordings in the case on that. We'll be very open at our trial that torture took place uh, on that to, to enhance our credibility before the members. And the evidence we're gonna use in these cases will not be derived from torture at all. They'll all be detained from independent evidence that's found throughout the world. Again, thank you for my presentation. As I say, as to the factual basis of the rights I mentioned, go to that website and you'll see the statutory rights that the detainees have. So thank you for inviting me. And thank, thank you for joining us. And I'm sorry there was um, technical difficulties in bringing you in earlier, um, Francis. Um, I'm gonna turn um, to the audience now for, for questions. I'm, I'm, it's the point at which I give you due warning that I'm about to um, look for folks to, to come in with questions. Um, I will turn to a couple that are online um, first to give you a chance to ready yourselves. Um, we have some questions here um, from uh, Natalie Porter, who is um, online. She says, thank you for the opportunity to listen to you all tonight. Um, this is uh, for you, Mohamedou. How much support did you feel was available to you following your release from government organizations, family? Um, she followed up by saying, and this, this sort of goes to your point, Sonia, I, I think, um, or partly, she says, have you felt you were treated as a free man following um, your release? How would you respond, Mohamedou? First, I have to confess. <laughs> uh, during uh, Mr. Gallagher's uh, answer statement, I kept myself, I contained myself not to laugh out loud. Honestly, and I was, oh my God, I shouldn't be laughing. So I know this is very serious matter because it's a matter of life and death. But all those beautiful rights that he told you, I haven't seen one single, and this reminds me of us Muslims. We say, look, we have the Quran, so beautiful thing, but we don't practice them, you know? And it reminds me also of my Catholic brothers and sisters, you know, they just read you so beautiful thing, but in real life they don't practice them, you know, my friends I'm talking about. So I was kidnapped mafia style, four years in prison. I never saw a lawyer. 
I was the first death penalty case. I was tortured and made to sign a confession. I was pushing every day to see a judge. Every day I was talking, I want to see a judge. And when I when and they came to me, they said, if you go see the judge, we will not release you. I said, but I need to see a judge. And then when I came to the judge, it was like surreal. Because very and American people, first, by and large, are very good people, I must confess. Two, they are one of the brightest minds I ever seen. And they, I love the way they coined like their laws. Patriot Act doesn't say I'm gonna screw your rights act. It says Patriot Act. So everybody who isn't not Patriot, no one is going to say it. So it's Patriot Act. I vote for it. I would vote for it every day. And I was like in shock. I was watching my trial unfolding two set of very bright lawyers discussing AUMF. This is not a bad word, by the way. Authorization to use military force. The president of the United States of America signed some paper, an executive order, that everybody on this planet can be kidnapped and brought to prison. Can you believe this? This can't be a good thing in the world. And they were discussing whether Muhammad al Salahi, a Bedouin from Mauritania who never been to the United States of America, is subject to the talk, the signature of the United States of America. The judge released me, order my release. US government refused, completely showing complete contempt to the rule of law. They refused his order. This is on record. It can be read online. They refused and they kept him for six more years until CIA, FBI, DOD, and I don't know others because so many organizations, they said Muhammad al can be released. And uh, I want to say hi to uh, Natalie. And uh, thank you so much for everything you do for human rights and for the detainees. No, I have really to struggle because the US government ordered my government not to give me my passport. And I had to do so much and to have so much help from my UK family and our family so that I could get my passport. I was never convicted of a crime, mind you. But the United States of America government or some people, not all people in the government are bad. I dare say, the vast majority of the people working in the US government are good people. But for some reason, there are very few bad apple that called my government and said, do not allow him to talk. Do not allow him to travel. Guess what? I am traveling now, and I'm in the UK, and I have a very big mouth. I'm just containing myself. And keep talking. <laughs> And we want to hear more. Can I um, ask folks in the audience to, um, in the, uh, please, hands raised, and I will ensure that a microphone finds you. Um, I saw you first, sir. sir. Um, and can you, I'm told you must stay seated and announce who you are. Uh, Tom Brake, the director of Unlock Democracy, an organization that campaigns for democracy in the UK. Uh, my question was, what do Mohamedou and, uh, and Sonia think is the most effective pressure point on the US government to get them to close Guantanamo? Sonia, maybe start with you and then hear from Mohamedou. I mean, I think it's, it's really important that governments like the United Kingdom are reinforcing to the United States what a barrier that the ongoing institution of Guantanamo is to the work that states like Britain are trying to do to haul us back from this collapse of norms. I mean, there's, this bilateral pressure is unbelievably important government to government. Now, um, obviously, there is a terrible power imbalance um, in those relationships. But, you know, President Biden, you know, clearly um, understands that Guantanamo is, a, is, a, is an ongoing stain on the reputation of the country that he leads. He's pledged to close it. 
Um, but as with successive presidents before him, he's deciding to expend his political capital, you know, on other parts of his of his agenda. And it's just so very important um, that states are keeping the pressure up uh, on this. I, I, I mean, I just don't know what other levers we have um, in a context um, where the United States just remains as powerful as it is. So perhaps not the most sophisticated answer. Um, and I'd actually quite like to hear your views on this um, as um, a, a former um, a member of parliament who, who has got such a wonderful legacy um, on these things. So, I mean, I don't know if we could bring, bring yeah, you would, what, what are your views? Well, I, I think you, you've, you've uh, certainly partially uh, answered the question. Um, <clears throat> I don't know whether there can be a, a, a link established with what's happening in Ukraine, for instance. Um, I think the connections between uh, the UK, the US and Europe more generally are going to be strengthened by what's happening in Ukraine. So that might provide an opportunity, perhaps a stronger opportunity than existed uh, until Ukraine happened to, to use that leverage, perhaps on issues like, uh, like Guantanamo. That's great. Thank you very much. And remind me your organisation, sir. Unlock democracy. I think we all need to learn more about that. Thank you. Um, I'll turn for, for more questions, please. The lady over here in the blue, <laughs> blue top. Thank you. Hi there. Um, Sophia Rose, Chatham House International Law Programme. Um, thank you very much for coming today. It's an absolute privilege to hear you all speak. Um, my question is, I suppose, for all of you, but um, hearing Mohamed O's experience and hearing the um, supposed rights that the detainees have, what do you think is the best way to ensure transparency and accountability to make sure the det detainees actually get these rights and they are protected and you know have basic human rights at least so we can protect people? Yeah, so I just want to make a comment because your question is really beautiful. I want to tell you a secret that you already know. What the government is telling you is not what they say to American behind closed door. So from my experience, they tell you Guantanamo Bay must be closed, doesn't belong into a democracy. That's not what they tell Americans. They tell Americans, we know what you do, we really support you. Because, you know, those guys are bad. How do I know this? So every single detainee who ever made to Guantanamo Bay is banned from entering all countries. So when I tried to enter this country, it took me so long and I have to hire a lawyer, you know, very beautiful lawyer, you know, Daniel, you know, uh, and uh, Daniel Fernie is really good lawyer, and uh, he, we had to go through so much, you know, just in order for me to come to this country, because I was on some blacklist. So the first thing they should do, first they should accept that innocent people who were kidnapped to Guantanamo Bay are victims. And they should be given, you know, a, a podium to talk and share their experience. Because this is one of the bigger things that the United States doesn't want uh, to hear around the world. So you cannot ensure the rights of Guantanamo detainee in Guantanamo Bay, because Guantanamo Bay is not designed to guarantee uh, justice. Guantanamo Bay is a place to gather intelligence. It's not to find justice. We have to understand that, you know. We have to take those people out of Guantanamo Bay and put them in a regular trial, you know. That's the only way we can ensure their rights. My, this is my opinion, I may be wrong. Does anyone in the room have an opinion on that? Do you? What would your view you be on that? Gosh, that's a big question. <laughs> I suppose, um, I do believe you're right, Guantanamo Bay should be focused on intelligence building. Obviously, we need to get intelligence if you know, these people have information to give, but um, I'm a big human rights advocate, and I do think there's a way and a place, and people need to make sure there are rights. I think once the trial has been conducted and they are proven innocent, they should be almost not rewarded, that's the wrong word, but given all the rights and more, like you were saying, they need to be given a platform, they need to be able to share their experience, they need to be offered rehabilitation to make sure they can continue their life when they've had a lot of time and many other things taken away from them. 
Um, so I think there needs to be accountability, really clear accountability to prevent any atrocities of human rights happening. But it should, we should obviously need to gather intelligence as well to protect as many people as possible. So I think it's a fine line and a fine balance. But I think the priority should be accountability, transparency, intelligence building, but also protecting human rights as much as possible. Yeah, thank you. Um, sir, right in, in the middle here, the gentleman. Please. <coughs> Hi there. Thanks for a great event. I'm Andy Worthington. I'm a journalist and activist, and I'm about to meet Mohammedu in person for the first time. I've been writing about Guantanamo and campaigning to get it closed for 16 years. The situation that we're in at the moment, to, you were asking for commentary, so <laughs> I hope this is okay. Um, what has happened over the last year is that 99 elected representatives in the United States for the first time sent letters to President Biden to say, we think it is uh, unforgivable that with the 20th anniversary of Guantanamo, the United States is continuing to hold people without charge or trial. So they said to the President of the United States, if they're not going to be charged, we must release them. And that's the situation that we finally got to. We now have 19 of the 38 men still held approved for release. We have only seven men who are still what was described in the media as forever prisoners, people who have never been charged, but who the United States doesn't want to release. And the rest of the men are on, uh, on trial. Whether that, that trial system works or not is another question. But to have reached the point where we look like we might be seeing only the men still held who are going to be charged is i think the best kind of progress we can reach with guantanamo but what we're going to need those of us who are interested in seeing that this never happens again is finding ways to make sure that that's the case and that's i think where continuing to press for accountability is so important um, eventually there needs to be some kind of truth and reconciliation situation regarding Guantanamo and what took place there and cast iron promises that the United States, when provoked in future by whatever, will not abdicate its domestic and international laws, treaties and responsibilities in such a shameful manner again, because we're stuck 20 years on with these problems because everything was torn up 20 years ago and it's so difficult to put justice together out of its ashes. Mm -mm. Yeah. And can I ask you a, a follow on question? And it, it picks up on, I think, the, the, the point that Sonia was making earlier, which is um, to your excellent point that we now have 99 elected officials kind of writing to the president to say, come on, let's let's get this done, shall we? Um, why do you think why is the needle turning? um in in the us what, how would you explain is it simply it's 20 years and it's back in our minds or is is there something happening under the surface that that perhaps we wouldn't otherwise understand or see what's your reading on that well i think it, to some extent time has been important that 20, 20 years you know we we most of us can't help it we define anniversaries according to the big numbers you know so 10 years when guantanamo was open for 10 years there's a flurry of media activity. 20 years was another significant date. But I also think there's been a steady buildup of things exactly like Mohamedou's book, um, the various other media. I encourage people to go out and look. There's a brilliant book that came out last year by a former prisoner called Mansour Adafi. Mansour was, he's a Yemeni, so the entire US establishment won't send Yemenis home. So he got sent to Serbia. He's treated like a terrorist in Serbia. He's basically, uh, unable to travel freely, the problem that Mohamedou was saying, as all former prisoners experience. But he's kind of trapped there. He's written this extraordinary book full of um, humor and humanity, something that we recognize from, from Mohamedou's work. Um, so I think that's really helped. Yeah. Um, but that's otherwise, helped. I think it's, the, it's, the, it's an understanding, not just that it's been 20 years, but that unless action is taken it will go on forever it will be another that men who were never charged or have never been tried could die in guantanamo mm. 10 20 years from now yeah. unless yeah. it's resolved 
Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to we're, we're sort of drawing towards the 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 end of our hour. I've been given special permission um, on account of the technical difficulties to run over a few minutes, which might cost all of you sort of a couple of sips of a glass of wine, I suspect. But I just wanted to check whether there are any other questions in the room. And what I might do is I might if there's more than one, I might gather a few up. I will bring them back to um, our speakers. I think we may have lost our Fran. He's, he's the technical issues have got in the way of him. So I, I will take the gentleman um, at the back, the gentleman here, and then we'll come back to the panel um, for some closing comments. Oh, and, and one other gentleman has squeaked in at the last moment. Well done, sir. I applaud your tenacity. Uh, gentleman at the back. So there is a bit of a comment and, and a bit of a question as well, actually. Assalamu alaikum, Mohammedu. Uh, thanks so much for coming. My name is Yusuf Hassan. I work in the Africa program at Chatham House. And actually, and <clears throat> where I wanted to start was the, the bedrock of the policy and the CVE strategy that was come up following, of course, 2001, but before that, the bombings that took place at the African embassies was as a result of the need for CVE to be seen as an important thing that every government did. A lot of it led to groupthink, a lot of it led to ideas around radicalization that forgot about local context and forgot about the, the really the, the deep struggles that a lot of these populations felt. And actually, a question off that is to say, what is the future? We are a policy institute, Chatham House is a policy institute, we're a place for ideas and hopefully not groupthink. How can we move away from policies that allowed what happened to, to Mohamedou and the countless other prisoners at Guantanamo and the other black sites across the globe, which mustn't be forgotten about as well? How can we move away from that? And actually, what role should or can the, the former prisoners play in ensuring that their governments don't repeat the same mistakes? In the UK, we of course, I've seen the prevent strategy, which is now, of course, under review. I say as someone who grew up in, the, in that era where schools and universities and, and other institutions were told to survey me and ensure that I wasn't becoming an extremist. How can we move away from, from really redundant thinking that actually doesn't serve the purpose? Thank you very much, sir. Thank we'll you. come to this gentleman at the front and then um, to you. I haven't forgotten you. Hello. Thank you for a wonderful conversation. Uh, my name is Hugo Barker. I, I work at Imperial. And I might be, this might be just my naivety, but I don't really know about Britain's involvement. I was wondering if you could talk more about it and talk about if there's anything that needs to be answered for around Britain's involvement. I, think, I suspect we'll come to you for that, Sonia. And the gentleman in the rather fetching Bernie. This is jacket. Bernie. <laughs> Bernie Sullivan. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Um, my name is Bernard Sullivan. Um, I just, it's a funny little anecdote, really, but it's amazing how from very small beginnings things can happen. Um, this tour really began years ago when traveling in a train with my wife, she picked up a newspaper, a copy of The Guardian, and it serialized part of. Um, Mohamedou's uh, imprisonment. And she said, we got to do something. What can we do? Um, can we contact her lawyer? So we found the name of her lawyer, Nancy, and we sent her an email and she immediately replied. And that started a chain of events of communicating with Mohamedou. Um, we then met him for the first time in person um, when he came to England last year. And we said to him, would you like to take part in a UK wide speaking tour if we can arrange it? And he said, wow, fantastic. And with several of us working together, um, my niece Oriel and several other people, we got this tour together. And the culminating event of that tour, and which is where my question comes, is when Mohammedu will be invited to parliament where he will have the opportunity to meet some members of parliament and peers. And what the question is that I would like to ask Sonia and yourself, Rachel, is how do you think that the appearance of Mohammedu in our parliament could help to move things towards the closing of Guantanamo? Thank you very much. And can I, you're a wonderful reminder of the difference we can all make in, in our everyday lives to change the world. So I'm really pleased that, that you um, shared that story with us. Um, Sonia, can I come to you first um, 
to, I mean, there's, there's too much for you to pick up on everything, but perhaps if you can pick up on a couple of points and then I'll come to you, Mahamadou. So on the question um, around British collusion, um, it's, it's very well understood um, that there was intelligence cooperation um, by, by Britain um, with the rendition um, program and um, indeed um, flights um, understood to have passed through British airspace en route. Um, you know, British um, interrogators um, were in rooms, it, it, it appears, um, uh, asking questions, leaving when the torture happened, they then came back. A lot of this um, was, you know, was all, it was all supposed to be looked at properly um, by the judge-led inquiry um, that the Conservative Party uh, promised. Um, then further evidence came uh, to light and um, that process was uh, stalled. Um, there was um, a case um, that then led to um, a big financial settlement and a, a parliamentary apology and then um, the commitment to deliver on the promise of the judge-led inquiry, which had ostensibly just been suspended, um, was dispensed with altogether. Um, the, um, one of the parliamentary committees that focuses on security um, uh, did its very best, um, although was hamstrung in all sorts of procedural ways from really getting at the truth. And so um, the British public still does not to this day understand the full truth about what happened. And that is a disgrace, frankly. It is an absolute disgrace, including because concrete promises were made and then broken um, by our government. Um, so there is a lot of material out there that you can read, um, a lot of it re you know, redacted, obviously, um, that will help you to kind of um, learn a little bit more about the complicity. Um, the fact of the complicity is not in dispute, however. You know, it's a really dark episode in British history as well that stems from you know, the decision by our Prime Minister at the time, Tony Blair, um, you know, to, to kind of go all in um, with the Americans and to agree that the rules had changed and that they could be dispensed with. And we're still working our way back from that. And I, and my, can, you, can I share a good news? story on this oh, on this please yeah. do please do yeah so one of the things that happened across the liberal democratic world after 9 11 was that public support for the absolute ban on torture plummeted amnesty did you know a whole lot of opinion research across many many countries that showed this to be the case because when Prime Ministers of countries like Britain and presidents of, of countries like the United States say these rules aren't for us anymore, thank you. Public opinion follows. It was absolutely, you know, terrible. But we're turning the tide. It's taken 20 years, but we are turning the tide. And last year, Freedom From Torture and a number of other human rights organisations, together with survivors, um, and a whole lot of brilliant figures actually, um, you know, from across the political spectrum and from the military world worked together to stop the government of Boris Johnson from legislating de facto impunity for torture committed by British troops abroad in, in countries like Afghanistan and Iraq. And we stopped him from doing this via people power and via a very smart advocacy game and the bringing together of ordinary people with caring people like yourself, sir, who um, have decided to stand up and reclaim these values. And over the last 1.5 years, we have moved public opinion by 10% um, on the question of whether torture is acceptable in any, in any circumstances. Now 65%, a clear majority of the country, agree that torture is never acceptable. And so, you know, 20 years on, we're, we're finally recovering that lost ground. And if you are worried about this, I, I, my, my final message to all of you tonight would be, don't be passive in your support for norms like the global absolute ban on torture, get active, because it's working. And we stopped something terrible happening in Parliament um, last year. So, you know, we now have 100,000 people who are part of the, you know, 
anti-torture movement that we are rebuilding here in Britain. And if you want to get involved, come onto the website of Freedom From Torture and, and sign up and we'll let you know how you can be involved in this, in this, in this great work. We're, we are, we're winning again. We are winning again. That's brilliant to hear. Um, Mohamedou, can I offer you the final word, sir? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know how to top any of these beautiful things that they were said. But I'm just commenting on your brother of what you said. So the biggest loser in this are people from the Middle East and in Africa. And I am not waiting on the government anymore. We need to take the example of Bernie and Susie. They are doing it. You know, they are doing it. They're helping people, refugees, asylum seeker and victims of torture. I am working with my former guards, Steve Wood, who is the boss of my guards. And we go everywhere, we do speeches, because we realize what my family wants is what his family wants. We don't want to get killed. We want to have a good job, we want to eat pizza, for instance. <laughs> you know? And you know, going everywhere, spreading peace and spreading kindness. Guys, kindness is the only thing that the more you give, the more you get back. And that is a very good investment. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me here. Yeah. I can't think of a better way to finish. Um, I know you all want to join me in thanking this extraordinary panel, and I think Francis has beamed back in again at the right time to, to get some thanks as well. So please join me in the time-honoured way of saying thank you. My suspicion, my suspicion is that I'm, I'm going to be saying this to a group of people who are going to say, we know, we know all that already. But given the importance of this subject matter and the interest in the room, I just wanted to say, if you want to know more, if you want to read more, if you want to watch more, if you want to listen to more about the important stuff we've been um, talking about tonight, please, please buy Mohamedou's book and read it and the book that the gentleman um, in the middle uh, mentioned as well. Uh, a very wise man once said, whoever listens to a witness becomes a witness. And I think it's duty bound on all of us to witness and see and understand what has happened. Um, so to your point, sir, that it doesn't, it doesn't happen again. So please do that. It's been a wonderful film made of it, uh, The Mauritanian. Um, and um, I, as I said, I would also please urge you to take up Sonia's offer to go to the Freedom From Torture website look at the wonderful stuff they do, donate. I'm not supposed to say that at Chatham House, but I'm going to say it anyway. Donate and get involved, get involved in their campaigns. This is, um, none of this happens unless we make it happen. So let's go talk some more uh, in the Neil Malcolm room, wherever that may be. I will see you there in a few minutes. And thank you so much for your interest and for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much.